Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Sankup Global Summit uh, 2022, or the 14th uh, Sankup Global Summit. Uh, my name is Ariel Molina with the Sankup team. The session that we are getting started with now is why digital finance for MSEs may be the way forward. And we have an awesome panel with us today, um, so which I would like to hand it over to Swati Sohmi uh, with MSE Finance in the Digital Age. Uh, Swati, over to you. Thank you very much, Ariel. Um, could I first ask all the participants to please mute, mute your microphones? Um, and just a, a quick mention that we'll be taking questions through the chat. Um, so we have uh, quite a short session, and so I'm going to try to, to save as much time as we can for our panelists to present their uh, perspectives, and then we'll give everyone enough time at the end to ask their questions. And just if you could limit those two um, through the chat. Uh, so just to start us off, um, I think I, I don't need to state the problem for this audience. As we all know, there are nearly half a billion micro and small enterprises around the world. Um, and these enterprises, MSCs, are extremely crucial for providing livelihoods uh, for low-income households and their communities. Now, despite the years of effort by the international community, the one issue that continues to remain with this sector is that, that many of them are either severely underfinanced or sometimes completely financially included. And a big part of this problem is that there continue to be significant supply side constraints. So traditional finance service providers have either lacked the ability or the willingness to reach these um, enterprises and in some cases to meet their specific needs. Now with the proliferation of new types of providers, um, particularly those that are leveraging technology to maximize their reach, we see some hope there's potential to start reaching out to these micro and small enterprises and meeting their financial needs. However, technology by itself is not a, financial, is not a silver bullet. Um, there is still some constraints even with regard to digital finance. I think primary among those uh, most would agree is the digital capacity of the enterprises in question. So while the COVID pandemic has been extremely effective in pushing a lot of these enterprises into embracing digital technologies, and building their businesses, evidence suggests that actually the digital capacity of a lot of these enterprises still remains quite low, particularly enterprises that are, that are the smallest, those that are in the informal sector, and those that are owned by women. Um, these are also the enterprises that are often most in need of the finance that we're talking about. Um, the other big issue that remains is there is a significant trust barrier in the way that these enterprises view digital finance providers, and particularly the new wave of fintechs. Um, last year, CGAP conducted primary interviews with micro and small enterprises in India, Kenya, and Peru. The purpose of the exercise was to try to understand how different enterprises view finance based on the sector they come from, the gender of the owner, the growth stage of the enterprise, their entrepreneurial mindset. Um, but largely, it was to understand how do they view finance, what are their challenges, what are their apprehensions. And what we find al almost unanimously through that research is that a high-tech, high-touch approach seems to be preferable for these enterprises, an approach that some of our partners call a digital approach. This is where you would overlay a physical aspects um, within the context of a digital platform. Um, and this approach tends to have be more effective both in terms of reaching um, these enterprises, but also in terms of building trust. So this is the issue that we're here to discuss today. And both CGAP and myself personally are extremely excited with the panel that we've been able to pull together. And um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start quickly introducing our panelists and then ask them to share their perspectives with us. So I'll start by introducing, I'll start with the ladies. Um, first, let me introduce to you Fatma Nasujo. Fatma is the Global Head of Corporate Operations at Wasoko based in Kenya. Even prior to joining Wasoko, Fatma has extensive experience with tech startups um, across a range of FinTech and banking services. Prominently, Fatma was the Chief Operations Officer at, at 4G Capital and the Head of Operations and Talent at the African Management Initiative. I've had the opportunity to meet with Fatima myself in person uh, earlier this year in Kenya, and I, I'm sure that she's gonna have some very interesting ideas to share with you. Welcome, Fatima. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Payal. Payal is the Vice President for Social Impact International Markets at the Microfinance Center, uh, at the, sorry, at the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. Prior to joining MasterCard, um, Payal spent several years heading global community programs at Standard Chartered Bank. She's worked for a wide range of public sector organizations, including the World Affairs Council, the Global Philanthropy Forum, and the Earth Institute at Columbia University. Pyle has several affiliations and serves on the board of various organizations, 
Pail is an old friend of CGAP and I'm really looking forward to hearing her perspectives today. Thank you, Pail, and welcome. Next, I'd like to introduce Sanjay. Um, Sanjay Sharma is the co-founder of iFinance, an organization that is committed to providing finance to the smallest enterprises, including those in the informal sector. A serial entrepreneur himself, Sanjay has extensive experience in the banking sector, working with institutions such as HDFC Bank, ICICI Bank, Standard Chartered Bank, and Max New York Life Insurance. Notably, in 2003, Sanjay set up Tamwil PJSC, the first Sharia-compliant housing finance company in the UAE, and that grew to be the largest housing finance company in the country. iFinance is a partner with CGAP in our MSC finance program, and every time that I meet Sanjay, I, I learn something new. So I think he's definitely going to have some interesting things for this audience today. Welcome, Sanjay. And last, but definitely, definitely not the least, uh, I'd like to welcome um, Koi Oyinka. Koi is the co-founder of Boost Nigeria, a B2B e-commerce platform that's focused on serving the smallest retailers through a combination of working capital finance and market insights. Um, prior to co-founding Boost, Koi was the chief marketing officer and the chief business development officer at My Mobile Health in Lagos. And he was also the founder and CEO of Inmi Global, uh, an e-commerce site that aimed at providing new sales channels for SMEs and artisans and bringing their goods to market. Koi has also worked on several other positions around the globe, including bringing Zipline to Ghana and in an effort to transform their emergency health services. Um, Boost is also a partner with CGAP on our MSC finance program, and I'm delighted to welcome Koi to this panel. Um, a very warm welcome to you, Koi. Now, I know that everyone is here to hear from the panelists rather than myself. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the experts to share their thoughts. We'll start with some opening remarks. Uh, uh, perhaps, Koi, if you could kick it off. And then Pail, Sanjay, Fatma. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Swati. Um, my name is Koyo Yeyinka. I'm the co-founder and chief commercial officer of Boost Nigeria. Um, we work in the FMCG space, trying to digitize from the manufacturer to the retailer acknowledging that there's already an existing infrastructure of mostly informal, semi-formal or slightly formal um, players already in the space and looking for the best way to incorporate everyone into a functioning system that finds more value for everyone so we can get working capital for the retailers. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Kai. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm Payal Dalal, Senior Vice President for Social Impact at the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. The center is a philanthropic hub and social impact arm of MasterCard, the company, and we focus on inclusive growth. Um, but specifically to get to inclusive growth, which is really making sure that everyone benefits from economic development, we focus on financial security at household and individual level, small business growth, and impact data science. And of course, a lot of our work focuses on small business and really bolstering their resilience and putting them back on the path to growth. And our hypothesis is that digital can be a really, really important mechanism to help micro and small businesses realize that resilience. Um, I'm excited about the panel today because we have found that this blend of touch and tech is really critical in ensuring the inclusive digitalization of micro and small businesses. So I look forward to the conversation today. Thanks, Swati. Thanks, Payal. Sanjay? Sanjay, you're on mute. Good morning, everyone. To everyone who has been logged on to the session, I work at iFinance, and uh, at iFinance we specialize in providing working capital loans to unorganized micro enterprises in India. Uh, in doing so, we hope that we will create a transformative, uh, tr transformational uh, social impact uh, at the bottom of the pyramid market. Uh, in India alone, there are 60 million tiny scale enterprises and uh, because they do not have great history or they do not maintain proper books of accounts and their loan requirements are small, uh, banks have not been able to address this need for many decades. And yet these micro enterprises fulfill a very important role in the economy because they are the ones that provide employment to 110 million people, which is almost 90% of the total non-agricultural employment in, in India. So important segment surely and iFinance has Try to move against this tide. We have so far given loans to about 400,000 businesses using a digital model. And while the initial step in the loan origination in our case is assisted, 
through a branch uh, person and a loan officer on the field. But thereafter, the remaining process uh, of loan origination is paperless and it is digital. Uh, our underwriting uses data science te techniques, use uh, various operating markers in clusters uh, to underwrite, and a lot of that is uh, paperless again. And using this approach, we have been able to build a loan portfolio that is large. And at the same time, it has shown lower delinquencies than, uh, than most banks. Um, uh, I'm very happy to join this panel. Uh, it will be a good, uh, good opportunity for me to learn and to share some of the experience, uh, experiences that we have had. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sanjay. Fatma? Uh, my name is Fatma Nasujo from Wasoko. Uh, Wasoko is a B2B e-commerce company that transforms informal and fragmented retail markets. We are using our platform to enable retailers to order products at any time uh, via SMS or the mobile app for free same-day delivery. We also offer customers financing and technology solutions to help retailers grow. We have a wide base of customers across seven countries in Africa. And the things we come up against is literacy levels, different ones, different countries, access to digital channels, and then confidence in interacting online. This means we have to have a high-tech, high-touch approach towards delivering our services, enabling them to seamlessly move online or offline, depending on what they do. Some of the interesting things we see is that we have customers who interact and engage with us entirely online. Uh, we have some who will check prices online and then order uh, on offline channels, either by calling our sales representatives or sending messages. And then we have some who entirely just want to deal with um, the sales reps without um, going directly to the app or emails. So it's exciting for me to be on this panel to speak about the differences of how um, they experience the platform and what we've learned about meeting our customers in the channels of things. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Fatma and, and all of the panelists. Um, so the next part of our discussion is the moderated discussion. And, and basically what I'll do here is I'll just pose a question to, to two of our panelists, and then um, I would invite all the other panelists to jump in or interject if there's something additional that you have to add from your experience. Um, I would ask you to keep your comments to maybe no more than two or three minutes, um, just so that we have enough time for questions at the end of the session. Um, so maybe we'll start with Pyle and Coyle. Um, from your perspective, what does a digital approach uh, for serving underserved MSCs actually look like, particularly those that are you know, less digitally inclined? Um, Pyle, do you want to kick this off? Yeah, absolutely. So Swati, let me just give you a couple of examples of how we've approached this blend of touch and tech. Um, so the first program that I want to talk about is with Fundacion Capital in Mexico, Peru, Colombia, and Brazil. And what we were trying to do was to help micro and small businesses digitalize basic operational processes and make sure that these digital operations were kind of complementary to e-payments because we've seen in the data that payments and social media marketing are kind of the most popular when it comes to the beginning of the digitalization journey because micro and small businesses see more immediate return on those investments. And so what we did was we paired the micro and small businesses with guides and coaches to really help them overcome adoption and usage barriers. And what we found is that the adoption of the digital tools and digital financial services went from 7% when it was just here's the tool, use it, to 14% when paired with the coaching to really help answer these onboarding questions and really to help reduce um, friction. So that's one example of how, um, you know, if you, if you provide the coaching and the guidance, you'll find that adoption does increase. Um, the second example is in India with um, access development services. We created a character called Budi Money, um, which is a cartoon character really trying to encourage micro and small businesses to do a number of things from um, formalizing and registering their business to adopting e-payments. And what we tested were three approaches. So we did an RCT and we took a purely digital approach where Budi Money, we just sent out these videos and cartoons via WhatsApp. 
We did a low touch approach where we brought everyone together to talk about it and then sent out the videos. And then we did a high touch approach where we not only did the videos, but we had one-on-one -on -one advisory services and one-on-one -on -one mentoring and kind of regular facilitated meetings. And what we found is when we were purely digital, so just kind of pushing through the content, only 0.5% of entrepreneurs um, adopted digital business changes. And that's compared to the high touch approach where we got 26% of the entrepreneurs to implement digital business changes. So again, a really important illustration of why this high touch is really important, especially in the beginning. Um, and it goes back to Swati's point around trust. Um, a lot of these populations that we work with on the micro side, and especially around the women led business side really lack trust in organizations, they lack trust in technology, they lack trust in kind of top down directions. And so really pairing the digital tools with this kind of high, high frequency coaching, mentoring, advisory services has been incredibly um, successful. And the last thing I'll just say is, especially on the women's micro entrepreneur side, what we have found is that the physical kind of convening is really important to women entrepreneurs. There's a real social aspect that women entrepreneurs really, really appreciate. So we have set up with Mandeshi in India, um, rural chambers of commerce, where women get together, network, share best practices, and then talk about the different digital tools they've been adopting to really help them streamline. And we've seen, again, that that kind of modality has worked best. So I'll stop there, but just a few examples of what we've seen in terms of how to blend touch and tech. Really interesting, Pyle. I think that's um, that's, a, that's an aspect to consider, right? The financial literacy right at the front end. So when you're beginning the journey with these customers, you're starting to coach and, and, and teach them right from the beginning so that they embrace it and it becomes sort of part of their the way they approach their finance. Koi, your thoughts? Yes, um, I am much, very aligned with a lot of what Payal said um, from what we've seen as well. <laughs> um, many of the systems we're working in already existed in a slightly informal setting. Um, having a blend of both the physical and the digital um, helps you take acknowledgement of what has already been in place. Um, and most of the time it's run by people. Um, then the second thing, which was, which has really stood out for us in why this is important. And I find it um, fantastic that you both spoke on that is the trust capital. Um, for us, you've spent your entire lifetime being trained on financial and digital tools, um, subconsciously or consciously, calculators in school, computers in university, um, you've joined banking systems, they failed you, you've learned. Um, in a place like Nigeria, for example, ATMs 10 years ago were not that big, but we've had a decade to slowly adapt ourselves to these practices. Now, for many retailers, we come with digital solutions and we want them to do a master's degree learning in two weeks. Well, like here's a phone, you need to learn how to use the internet, you need to learn how to do um, navigate financial tools, new apps, all these things. Um, so it's, it's often too much. So having a physical person, um, I think, bridges the trust capital. Instead of me saying, I want you to trust my app, which I'm still developing, I'm changing every week, it might glitch every now and then, I'm telling you, trust this person. Um, and it's that person I am now training um, to train maybe 1,250 other people. Um, but it helps with that trust because it's a lot of change and it's a lot of change asked of someone very quickly. So they need a sort of coach, a sort of mentor to walk them through that process. Um, and it's also the same for us as a system or as a company. Um, we are used to having like a bank wants to give a loan. You have mounds of data. Um, to do this. You have past um, transactions that people have made. You have a system that is there that helps you have trust before making these interactions with these retailers. Um, but in many of the situations that is gone. So we also need a bridge. We need someone who can go into the community and say, um, I'm going to put my hand up and say, in addition to the limited information you can gather on this person, um, I'm I'm a kind of vouch, voucher for this person. A lot of what we're doing is to provide working capital for these people. It's very 
difficult to just use a few months of computer analysis um, to get this right. So we also need um, someone who is physically going along the journey with them um, and being a bridge, um, a sort of trust bridge between us and the retailers and the retailers and the system. And if I could just add Swati to what Koya just said, so 100%, and I love that phrase, trust bridge. And what we find is that peers, so other micro and small businesses tend to be the trusted source. Mm -hmm. So if Koya and I say, hey, micro and small business, you need to do this, they're not going to listen to us. But if their fellow micro merchant two streets down says, hey, I digitalize my inventory and it's saving me tons of money, they really trust that advice and are more likely to adopt. So I think we really have to think about the role that micro and small businesses as a community and as kind of cross pollination play and how they can be kind of peer mentors. We um, we funded a program with Mercy Corps called Micro Mentor where micro and small businesses ask for help of other micro and small businesses. So, hey, I need a help. I need help writing a business plan. I need a help, you know, coming to up with the social media marketing. And we found that that was probably one of the most powerful programs we've ever run. Survival rates went up, job creation went up, because again, they're much more likely to trust each other than, you know, some, you know, somebody sitting in London or Lagos to say, this is what you need to do. That's definitely also consistent with the research that we did where they won't use, they won't be the first user of a new technology. They'll wait to see how their peers have used it, their experience with it, and that's what's going to help them determine whether it's something they want to embrace as well. Very yeah, absolutely. Helpful. I, and, I, I think, sorry, and, go ahead. Sorry, sorry Swit, Taji, just one more thing. Um, you know, when we're talking about high touch, it doesn't necessarily have to be physical high touch, right? One of the things we've seen in MicroMentor is um, micro businesses called each other or were on Zoom meetings. So it doesn't have to necessarily be in person to have the touch, but it's it's kind of the personal, like you know that there's an individual behind, that's what you need. Yeah, and we also found that uh, with a lot of them, so sort of the younger members of the community were helping some of the older members of the community digitalize and that, and that was part of it. That relationship was also working extremely well. Thank you both. Very helpful insights. I, I particularly like the idea of the, the peer mentors and the trust bridge. Um, Sanjay Fatma, could I ask you to talk a little bit about what parts of the customer journey you think are best suited to digitize versus those that, that really do need to be left physical, at least um, as we, you know, the ones that require the human touch points, at least at the start of the customer's journey when they're beginning to start, you know, start using these technologies. Um, Sanjay, would you like to go first? Sure, thanks. Uh, see, I think uh, I completely agree with what was mentioned about trust. And uh, while there is a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, topical uh, interest in digital processes, even investors want to see you, you know, look at digital processes and uh, sort of the media. But one has to understand that uh, you have to be uh, using a method which is suited to your customer segment. And I think that's what was coming through in the earlier discussion. So for excluded segments like micro enterprises that we, uh, we talk of or uh, MFI customers, a pure digital approach in originating faces two very big problems. The first one is the customer's ability itself. Customer is not skilled or has knowledge to negotiate the complex issue of choosing an optim optimal loan from a marketplace. Even when we ourselves go to a marketplace and we have to choose a financial product, you know how, how, how complicated it looks. It's very difficult to compare. So first thing is that our uh, the unorganized segment that we're talking about, the excluded customer we're talking about, is not skilled for uh, taking a good decision, just going to a digital marketplace. Second is the trust, which I again uh, 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 res resonate, that the customer requires a feeling of trust when he seeks a loan from an organized finance company. He's a person who has a he's a small individual in his own eyes and he's speaking to a large finance company and unless he can see that trust he's not uh, going to feel comfortable so the initial customer contact and initiating the loan application journey is very well suited to a high touch or a human touch point and uh, i think that's been our experience as we have gone along uh, that we use a branch and a loan officer to go and meet the customer to initiate the application. But after that, 
the rest of the customer journey, whether it is underwriting the loan or servicing the loan, or even the normal repayments is almost completely digitized. And this helps us leverage the obvious benefits of uh, economy that digital uh, brings in and the speed of service. Uh, when it comes to collection overdues, once again, the mix goes to a little bit of physical field collection because uh, while many of the customers pay through the digital methods, which are the ACH and the, um, and even uh, the digital payments like UPI, et cetera, but the overdue customers do need some physical touch, someone who can come there, remind them, and even collect cash if needed. So there's again a little bit of physical touch in the overdue collection piece. And uh, I think that's that's been our approach, that every physical touch point adds cost to the process. So the effort is to use every touch point, which is a physical or a human touch point, optimally. We're not saying that eliminate it. We are saying that it is necessary, but use it optimally. For example, we can disburse a loan directly into the customer's account. We have the ability to do that, but we still want the customer to come to the branch and take the uh, and sign the document because it will help the customer build that trust. He knows that there is a company and they have a branch here or their office here, and this helps in building that trust and giving them that assurance right at the beginning of the loan. Uh, so the customer's preference and comfort levels have to be kept in mind, but at the same time, we have to keep educating the customer to assist them to transition to a digital journey. And that is happening. We've seen that during COVID times, how payments have moved to digital. And I think it will continue to happen. More and more customers will feel comfortable with digital journey. And I think we should be ready for that. Thank you, Sanjay. So in interesting. So at the, at the beginning and the end, you think those are the most critical human touch points when you're acquiring the customer and then when you get to so sometimes the difficult part of the relationship with collections and overdues. Sure. Very interesting. Fatima, what's your experience with Vasako? Um, I think I agree with Sanjay um, and to add the perspective of it is that a lot of the time you are dealing with customers who are experiencing your service for the first time. Um, the first time they're getting a micro loan uh, borrowing from someone other than their family. The first time they're using their phone for something other than calling and texting um, to now be, uh, oh, I can use it to interact with this customer. I can use it to interact with the supplier. I can borrow a loan directly from the app. And it is important for you to take them on a journey, right? Uh, so in the beginning, you need to educate the customer. Doing it digitally is possible, but what to what um, success rate? Um, you need to, one, explain the product, build that trust. For some of them, it's even confidence in the product and that it can be done online. Yeah, so then this is how you borrow a loan. This is how you apply for a loan. It will be dispersed, for instance, to your MPESA, uh, or you will get credit. Um, and this is how you see where your credit is. You will get an SMS reminder. It's not a fraud star, it's actually a journey from the company. So you're walking the customer on a journey to confidence of this, this company it exists and this is what they give me and this is how I interact with them. So you can imagine setting that up from day one, everything, do it online. And you will see a lot of the digital lending companies that started in Kenya are being branded as fraud stars and everything else because they had direct access to the customers without anyone speaking to them um, on it. So it's important when you're launching a new product, when you're Entering a new market where you need to influence customer behavior. Yes, you can digitize, but what is the level of success that you want from it? You need to have good high tech, high touch. And then consider it an investment in the sense that you're taking your customer on a journey from offline to online and you have milestones on each step. Um, so like I said, we have customers who check prices on the app will not order on the app. This person is on a journey. So now that they know how to check the price, how do I get them to order? Yeah, so then it gives you information about, okay, they're not comfortable about how to make the same order. So you can suggest the same order and they can make an order on their own instead of having to call a customer. And then use those um, touch points, human touch points, uh, again, to add about upsell, educate, uh, the things other than new products, yeah. So we are in financial services. Like I said, some people, it's their first time uh, having a loan. Now that I'm in your shop, what are your margins? What product are they using to buy, uh, using the loan for? Yeah, so then how do I help you be more financial literate so that you are able to make better decisions with or without 
uh, our support. So it's a journey you're taking your customer on and you support them um, from offline to online, and that's the investment. And then you interact with them consistently on new products, uh, new uh, inventions that you want them to use. And then those ones need to be human touch points. They shouldn't be digital touch points. Um, in terms of like uh, experience, uh, reminders, for instance, in the beginning, you should have to have call customers and remind them, this is your due date. This is how you pay. This is when you pay. Um, now you automate it, send an SMS, and through our data, we're able to say these days are the most efficient ones to send. So two days before the due date, um, on the day of the due date, because they also have to make plans to make, uh, to make their payments. So how do you consistently remind them? Um, the cost of doing it one by one for every customer is too high. So then automating admin, automating repeated process, enabling a customer to do both online and offline will eventually lead to adoption of online. So um, those would be my points on this one. Very interesting. I think you also made a similar point to Sanjay, which is that if you, it is a high cost to have that human touch point. So you want to try to maximize it and get as much for the customer and for the, the company as you can out of that one human touch point. Extremely interesting. Um, so uh, Fatima, actually, could I follow up with that question and ask you, are there examples in your experience, because you, I know you've got a lot of experience with fintechs and working with tech startups, where a purely digital approach has actually been successful? Uh, and then what are some of the factors that came into play in, in, in actually making sure that that success um, was realized? I um, actually had to rack my brain on this one. Um, I, I would say the digital lending apps in Kenya. So we had an influx of them about five years ago, and we had multiple digital lending apps. The entire process was um, digital in the sense that the customer had to go to Play Store, download the app, register themselves, and then they would get an instant credit score, and then asked to apply within the limits of their credit limit. And then the money would be dispersed directly to um, MPESA. So they never met anyone. Marketing was done on social media and the uptake was very high. And this still happens um, in other products, for instance, the Fulisa product of the PESA, which does nearly a billion Kenya shillings every day. Um, so this is one of the, ones I would say that are successful. And I'd say the success of it is also built on MPESA uh, because it was not something that just came out of the blue, but because the users were already used to using MPESA. So then you were building on a customer journey that had already been created. And when MPESA was launched, they created their own agent network. It was something very new. They had a lot of customer education that then created capability for everyone else to be able to now use this new. Uh, apps and systems that have been built on it. Um, so I'd say not entirely successful on its own, but built on something that was already there. So someone else invested on uh, the customer journey from offline to online that they are now able to take advantage of. So it was still kind of digital after all. Yeah. <laughs> um, Pahil, your, your thoughts on this? Yeah, absolutely. And going to a point that Sanjay made, I think segmentation is incredibly important. So, so Swati, the, the points I'll make are really focused on those micro and small businesses who have begun their digital journey. So not those that are totally offline. Um, and so we've seen kind of three things. One is you have to go where the micro and small businesses are. You can't make them work for it. And so one of the things that we're doing is we're working with Grab, which is a super app in, in Asia. Um, and we're doing um, kind of short, sharp, digitalization videos for the Grab merchants who are already on the Grab platform to say, how do you maximize your experience? How do you maximize being on a digital platform? So that's one is, again, this is very much focused on those who micro and small businesses who have already started their digital journey. So one, you have to go to where the micro and small businesses are. The second is there's a real opportunity to create an habit stack. So create new habits on top of existing habits. So we're working with Common Sense Lab and Mercado Libre in Mexico. And what we're doing is we're doing behavioral nudges um, to incentivize micro businesses to save a little bit. So when they have a larger than normal sale, we're creating a psychologically 
backed nudge to say, hey, this is a bigger than normal sale. Do you want to save 5% of it? Because again, our theory is they're already on the platform. They're already selling. So can we just stack another habit, which is savings in this case, to their existing behavior? And then the third point, which I think builds a little bit on what Fatma was saying, was you have to make digital simple, quick, and easy. Um, and the first time um, a micro business, let's say, you know, tries a tries a digital application that's that's kind of the the fail succeed point if they have a positive experience great they'll continue if they have a negative experience you've lost them and so it's incredibly important that the first touch point that first digital experience is incredibly positive otherwise it's nearly impossible to earn their trust back and again we go full circle back to trust but that's why it's so important to have that first instance be really positive. So one of the things that we're doing in the UK, because this isn't just a global South problem on digitalization, um, is we're trying to create a kind of one-stop shop for micro businesses that has every single resource in the UK from you know public sector, local government, fintech, just to say, here's everything, just fill out a very short questionnaire and we'll use AI and algorithms to signpost you to what's going to make most sense for you on where you are in the journey. So we cut down the transaction costs because again, we have to come back to the fundamentals. Micro and small businesses are both cash poor and time poor. So how do we make it most easy? It's really interesting. You're right. We keep coming back to the issue around trust. And um, I think that, that it, you know, even looking beyond just digital finance, even ourselves, I, I would consider that most of us are quite digitally savvy. If you use an app for the first time and it's not intuitive and it's not simple, you're unlikely to go back to it. I'm very good at deleting them from my devices very quickly. Um, I was on a complaint yesterday with one of the apps saying, how this is not, this doesn't make any sense. Um, so um, so I, I guess the next question I have is obviously the reason why a digital approach is important is because you can scale, you can reach a lot more people um, faster through digital rather than the traditional financial providers. So what are some of the opportunities and challenges that you see in scaling this digital approach? Um, Koi, any thoughts on that? Yes, um, I think something that was interesting that was mentioned was the the idea that this is a journey for many of these retailers. Um, and just on the last point real quick, I find that in 20, it's 2022, it's very rare you're going to meet someone who has not had some sort of interaction with a digital space before. And if they got it wrong, um, it's going to be, it's a very, very difficult thing um, to convince them to, to, to try something new. Um, and that's why I feel like it's important we, we do merge the physical and digital, at least in the beginning. So even if you're not able to convince someone to switch to digital, at least you have feedback of why. You know what went wrong, you know what the shortfalls were, um, and you can also kind of leave them with the right message that perhaps it was this instance, it's not digital, it's not going to work for you in the long term. Um, so I think that's one of the advantages you can have with this. You still have that interaction, um, to check up with the person. Like was said by many people, um, it's, the, it's the scaling versus the cost, I think. I think it's, it's the real main issue. You need that physical interaction um, to build that trust, but at the same time, when you choose to expand, it gets very expensive very quickly. We're working with the Shakti Network in Nigeria, and I think they are big in India. We've been trying to grow it in Nigeria. And, as an example, we first tried to launch with, um, we call it self-ordering and assisted ordering. Self-ordering is they just do it themselves. We tried to launch with that and we had a 10% adoption rate. And this was in, we had picked the most, um, what we thought was the most forward market of all the Shakti markets in Nigeria. We added a field agent whose job was simply to stand next to the person as a sort of confidence, someone they had worked with all this while. This number jumped to 40% instantly just by having that presence. Um, so the merger of the two helps you, helps, helps the retailers try things they wouldn't have tried initially. Um, we are finding that because they have this relationship with this field agents, the ability to introduce a new product like um, loans, um, the ability to say, we want to expand your basket of goods. We see you sell this, we think something else will work for your market. 
all these sort of additional insights, benefits, it's, it's not something you can do very easily with a simple digital effect. You need someone that they trust that is saying, um, this is going to help you grow your business. So um, the Shakti Network, many of them started as tabletops and now they're mini supermarkets. And this journey was helped by someone. So suddenly removing that person from the equation and saying, just stick to digital, it's, it's going to break a lot of the way the system has, has grown organically. Um, but like they were saying, I think the, the question now or the point now to keep it sustainable is how do we digitize this, this aspects of the, of the human touch? Um, so I think someone mentioned that they were, they were sending the, the, um, the loan amounts or something to the people by SMS afterwards. I think it was Fatima. Yes. So how do we find out the, the aspects of the interactions with the physical people that are actually advantageous and helpful and beneficial to the retailers that we can digitize in a way that, that still keeps um, um, that effect? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't talk specifically to advantages or disadvantages, but these are just um, the effects I see of, of comparing the two. It's very interesting. We also found when we did, when CGAP did the primary research, we found that interestingly, one of the areas where people absolutely wanted a human touch point was when they pick up, they wanted someone to solve their queries when they had a question, right? So they don't want to have to deal with an, a voice recognition system that's going to, you know, just give them the digital replies. They want to talk to a human being and have the ability to do that through the process. And, and I think that's, um, it's a very interesting, it's exactly like you're saying, it's the confidence that it gives to know that there is a human behind this that I'm not just talking yeah. to. Um, yeah. Sanjay, you've, uh, iFinance has actually had a fair bit of success using this sort of digital high-tech, high-touch approach um, to reach out to a large number of customers. So can you talk a little bit about how, how you've handled uh, the scaling uh, aspects of this and, and some of the challenges with scaling, given the costs that are associated with the human aspects of uh, digital approach? Yeah, thanks, Swati. I think uh, scale and how do you scale up is exactly the tough question that a physical model has to answer. You know, and uh, it's all uh, good, good business and good leadership is about answering those tough questions. Uh, having a physical branch, field officers naturally create some resistance in scale up. And I think uh, uh, Koi also mentioned that that it, everyone knows that scale, scaling is a challenge when you have a physical uh, process. Uh, a digital model, theoretically, it offers a very quick way of scaling up. I say theoretically because when you scale up rapidly, it, has, it comes with its own challenges like how do you service the customers? And there are uh, so many stories of you know rapid expansion digitally, and then uh, there's a problem with customers don't know how to uh, redress their problems, or uh, uh, issues of uh, logistics. How do you make sure that uh, whatever is the physical delivery of a product, how does it keep up with the uh, rapid scale up? So it that's why I said it is theoretically a very uh, rapid scale up is possible, uh, and whereas on the physical side, having to hire a field team to manage their career aspirations, the challenges of retention. And we have seen a huge problem of retention after COVID across the world. Uh, this all needs a lot of management time, takes away a lot of management time and attention. So I think clearly scale up is a challenge when you are looking at physical uh, process. But on the positive side, the physical model or physical process, you selectively can ensure the good quality of origination and eliminate fraud. So especially if you have a product like you're lending to someone where your success depends on repeated repayments over a long period of time, the intent of the customer is important. And I think uh, a physical uh, look and see uh, can do many things in terms of uh, supporting your digital uh, ways of uh, eliminating fraud. It can add to that and bring a lot of quality into your, your process. And we found that right across and that's why having a branch presence is important because we can see the customer, we can test it. Yes, you have digital ways of doing video KYC, et cetera, but it's not the same thing as someone going and actually seeing what does the setup look like, speaking to a few neighbors. So when targeting an excluded customer segment, I believe that digital model is a difficult process to replace. And hence the focus should be 
and in iFinance, we relentlessly focus on three things. One is building the digital capability internally in each critical process. And I'm mentioning that because sometimes we feel that our customer is not yet digitally savvy. It'll take three years, five years. So let's wait for that to happen. No, I think we have to be ready with internal, internal readiness on digital process is important because you never know when customer will start moving towards digital journey. Uh, this requires a change in mindset that uh, embraces new approaches. Uh, example, in the COVID disruption period, uh, has had many customers move to payments, uh, their payments to digital modes, and that's happened very rapidly. Uh, as we always had arrangements for digital payments, we have seen ourselves that many of our customers, the overdue customers specifically, almost half of them have started paying through digital modes. So one is very important to build the digital capability. Let's not uh, think that this is, there's time to develop it and we can do it later. The second thing that we focus on is optimizing areas that can use the physical touch points. I mentioned that earlier, that it's an expensive real estate, so we have to get the most out of it. So we have to keep chipping away and replacing whatever processes we can using data science insights, using automation, and improving the productivity of every physical touch point. And I think we've done that uh, repeatedly over the last seven, eight years. We have seen the productivities change dramatically. The third thing that we uh, focus on is on incentivizing the customers and employees. I think Payal mentioned that you, know, you should nudge, the, nudge people into going into digital. I completely agree that you know, unless you have the nudges to customers as well as to employees to move to the digital journey, uh, it's not going to happen uh, as fast as you would like it to. Uh, we have done many things like repeat loans we used to do through the field team. Now we have brought it completely digital. Because you know why use the field team for doing a repeat uh, loan? Because customer already knows us; he has the trust. Uh, we have uh, started setting targets for non-cash repayments. So when we pick up overdue customers' uh, dues, uh, there's a target. We, our our own employees are uh, given uh, nudges into saying that we want to see more than half of the customers pay through digital. So these things are important, and if we do them well, again. Uh, I think digital to me in lending is a necessary evil, but how much you make out of it, the physical uh, presence uh, is important. And we should try to move as, as we go along to a more and more digital journey. And uh, I think for that, we need to keep investing and in building that capability. Thank you, Sanjay. You, you answered my next question, which was gonna be, is there a pathway to complete digitization? And I guess there is, it's just, um, it's gonna be different for each customer based on, on how they uh, embrace the digitalization. And I guess how, uh, I think Fatima, you raised the point around confidence. So it's not just trust, it's the trust in the provider, but also the confidence to be able to use the, the digital platforms um, themselves. And that, as that confidence grows, their journey towards digitalization gets, I think it progresses more and more. Um, so I, I, I think we've had some really interesting comments from all of the panelists. Um, I will open this up now to the audience for questions. I will ask you to type your questions into the chat box. I think we already have one. Um, and maybe we'll start with that and, and requesting others to just quickly type your questions with the chat box. So we have a question from Maureen. Um, she asks, have you found, uh, how have you found and supported the innovators and early adopters to have that ripple trust effect? Uh, Pile, I think this alludes to something that you had mentioned earlier on around some of the companies you're working with. Do you want to take this and then maybe other panelists can jump in? Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's absolutely a role for early innovators. I think the key is that, and not, maybe at risk of being a little bit hyperbolic, a, a Duca in Kenya isn't going to see Elon Musk's you know, Tesla and say, oh, they digitalize, I should digitalize, right? It has to be like for like. So a, a Kirana or a Duca needs to see another Kirana or a Duca doing something and then they'll want to, to adopt a similar process. So there's absolutely um, a, a very important role that early movers and innovators play. But again, it has to be kind of working within the same ecosystem. And again, as I said, we've seen really effective models around peer mentors um, to, to say, you know, I, I did this on social media marketing or I did this on e-payments. And then we see, you know, quite quickly others follow. But again, it has to be similar. Yeah, I was going to say, can I add to that? Um, 
the idea of segmentation, I think, is very important of understanding the different types and archetypes of customers that you have. Some of them are going to be innovators. Some of them might maybe never fully embrace the digital journey. They will always need some sort of physical impact, I think. Um, and it's about understanding the spectrum and building the right packages for each person. Some people, all they need is a phone and an internet, and they would figure everything out. Some people, it doesn't matter what happens. They just need that human trust there. So I think building customer segmentations and finding the right packages for the different cohorts um, will be will be very useful going forward. I couldn't agree more, Koy. And, and um, if you look at the publication that I was referring to earlier, where with all of this research we did, that's exactly what we focused on, which is based on you know not just the sector or the gender, based on on their socioeconomic status or their level of education or just you know their age. All of those factors play into how comfortable they get with digital. And so you need to be thinking about all of those aspects as you're thinking about how digitized you can make that journey, which is why I guess it has to somewhat be very customer centric and focused on their needs and, and requirements. Um, Sanjay, Fatma, anything to add around early innovators? Um, I'd say about uh, using the peers in the market, again, same experience. Um, in a previous company, when we initially launched, we were the first ones who were actually opening up uh, offering business loans to um, retailers. And their reaction was, I don't do loans. Loans are bad, these are the things that are going to happen. And so using ambassadors from within the region, just for someone to say, this is what I've done. This is how it helped me move from point A to point B, was actually helpful in bringing into that market. And we would then appoint our any customers in any new branches. This is the ambassador for this area. And it had a ripple effect in terms of they would ask them for advice. I need to get at a, a higher limit. Is this the right thing to do? And um, in that community, then they will support each other into don't do that, it's a bad thing. Uh, or you know your finances can't support it. Why would you do that? You need to do this, this, and this. And for us, the other benefit was um, they would come to you and tell you, don't lend this person. Everyone else is giving you money and he's not paying, or this is what is happening, it's not paying. So then it was like a community of we support each other. And then they would educate each other. I mean, this is how you handle loans. This is what you need to do to be able to, to pay on time. And they would also not officially be guarantors, but they are sort of um, peer partners in that this is what you need to do to be successful. This is how you go forward. You need to pay on time. Why are you not paying on time? Um, so this is um, some of the benefits of enabling those early adoption. Yeah, we found that a lot with people telling us that, you know, the the shop two two shops down that's who I go to for all of my financial advice and and no matter what you're not going to be able to replace that so you have to that's the person you have to reach because they're going to be the influencer. Sanjay any thoughts on this and then we have a few more questions from the audience. Okay, I feel that uh, um, it's a question between impact starters versus the VCs first of all I think VCs uh, do also invest in impact uh, businesses we are one of the impact businesses which is almost funded by VCs and some of them who have invested into large uh, uh, large unicorns. Now, I, may uh, I think if I'm reading that question right, why aren't there many unicorns out of impact businesses? My sense is that impact businesses typically need a digital approach. And that's what we were discussing today. And because of that, uh, scaling up to the levels that uh, typical unicorns do is a challenge. Uh, I think many of the digital unicorns have used to solve a large problem, but those problems are of people who are less, who have uh, less access to uh, finance versus people who have no access to finance. There's a difference. You know, so if I am a person who works in a second tier uh, employer and I don't get too many options and someone comes and offers me easy way of uh, borrowing when I'm buying a television, uh, you're only making an existing process smoother. Uh, versus uh, going to a person who has no idea, you know, how to take a loan for running their business. That's a very, very different challenge. So uh, not to take anything away from those unicorns. I think they've done wonderful work, but it is a different problem that is being solved. And I think that's why you will find impact startups not scaling up as rapidly as, uh, as some of the um, other digital players. Very interesting. We, we have a question from um, Joy as well. Um, anyone with experience in digital finance in the legal sector and education sectors 
which are highly um, personal level service industries. If any of the panelists want to take that question? So I'm guessing the answer is no, we don't have that much experience <laughs> in the legal and educational sectors. Um, so moving on to a question from Abhijit. My question is on the use of creating a central infrastructure like mobile phones where the Android is the central OS and each manufacturer overlays their OS or apps over it. Can we have a centralized credit appraisal fund transfer fulfillment platform where every new service provider can plug in and then customize for their use? I think that's a very interesting question. Um, Koi, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, <laughs> I think I think the next step after building um, customer archetypes would be to some degree standardizing um, a sort of platform for them to be able to access. Um, but I, I, it, I think it's going to be very difficult to have a core standard platform that plays across so many different markets, so many different archetypes. I think what we're going to find is increasing um, segmentation. So this, this might sound weird, but like the West African um, type A trader, something like that. We're going to have seg segmentation to that degree. And then maybe we can build a platform that addresses those people. Um, but I don't know. I think I think there are too many people doing too many different things, and the solutions we're having to come up with on ground is just way too varied um, to be looking at a centralized solution for now. But I, uh, but over time, perhaps perhaps there's room for that. I think that's an interesting point. I mean, just looking at the three business models that we have here, you're you're dealing with completely different segments of the MSC sector. And, and it is extremely diverse, right? We tend to look at micro and small enterprise and think it's a monolith, but it's far from. It is actually, there's lots of different variables that determine what their needs for finance will be, what their preferences are, what their apprehensions are. And so I think we're still a ways away from having that centralized credit appraisal system that can be used by iFinance or Soco and, and Boost. So, um, but I, I mean, it would be a, a nice ideal to work towards. Um, so I, I see that we, we still have a lot of questions, but I think we're almost out of time. So I wanted to um, take the last uh, couple of minutes to ask if any of you have any closing remarks. Um, Payal, Fatma, Sanjay, Koi, anything that you'd like to add to all the wonderful things that have already been said? Maybe just one final point, Swati. Um, it, and I think it's been kind of underlying our conversation you know, for this full hour, but we have to realize that digitalization is really about behavior change. It's not just about skills attainment or digital literacy. It is about behavior change, which is hard and which takes a really long time, which is why this blend of touch and tech is so critical and why we keep coming back to trust. You can't, you can't really push and force behavior change without having all of these other factors in place. Um, so that would be my final closing thought. Okay, thank you, Pyle. And I think that's sort of what I would summarize with as well is I think we've we've established through the discussion today that digital is here to stay, um, at least for the time being. So for this high tech, high touch approach isn't going away anywhere um, anytime soon, but we should be all working towards trying to digitize the journey as much as possible. But we need to make sure that through that process, we're building the confidence of the end customers, and we're also helping build their trust in digital finance providers as a whole. Um, so I'll, I'll take the last few seconds to say thank you very much to the panelists. I really enjoyed this discussion. And I can see from all of the questions that our audience has also really enjoyed it. Thank you very much to the audience. You've been fantastic. We will try to get back to everyone with answers to their questions by email. So the panelists, you're not done with me yet. I'll be coming back to you for some responses. Um, and finally, a very big thank you to the organizers of Sankalp. We really appreciated the platform to have this discussion and wishing you all luck for the, the remainder of the summit. Thanks, everyone.